Hello everyone, welcome to today's presentation sponsored by Seal Aftermarket Products. Let me play you a short video from Seal. Seal Aftermarket Products engineers and manufactures Toledo Transkit, the most trusted and complete kits in the industry for 25 years. Toledo Transkit gives you more critical components, more OE components, like premium seals and gaskets, more design enhancements, patented components, and all the little extras you won't find elsewhere. At Seal Aftermarket Products, we don't just make kits, we make kits better. Toledo Transkit is the number one choice of installers because of all the intensive research and development that goes into each component in every kit. Like re-engineered valve body gaskets, preventing EPC damage by eliminating the shredding you get from original equipment. Plus, all of the extra essentials that are included, like spring and screen filters that should be changed at overhaul. Toledo Transkit even includes loose valve body gaskets that fit all 19 bonded separator plates. When servicing Honda and Acura transmissions, shaft nuts are quite often damaged during removal. Toledo Transkit provides all the main shaft, secondary shaft, and counter shaft nuts so you don't have to try to reuse the originals or pay extra for them at the dealer. Honda Acura kits also include valve body screen filters, pressure tap washers, and other important components like bolt locks, roll pins, and pistons. What you get is a complete kit with great fit and no wasted time or worry about ordering extra parts. If you want the best sealing transmission kit in the industry, ask for Toledo Transkit by name. Okay, if you have any questions or comments, send your emails to webinars at atra.com. Any questions during the webinar, feel free to text them over to me, and I'll answer those the best that I can. <clears throat> Here's the schedule for the rest of the uh, webinars for this year. The next one will be August 16th, and we'll be covering the JF613 internal components. This year's expo in Las Vegas, October 27th to the 30th, in the Paris Hotel. That's Halloween weekend. Okay, today's presentation we're going to cover the 722.9, the internal components. The Mercedes-Benz 722.9 has several names to it. As you can see here we have W7A700, one of the Mercedes designations for it. A lot of us are familiar with the NAG2, which is the new generation gearbox 2, or as Mercedes calls it, the 7G Tronic, because it's a 7-speed transmission. It was their first 7-speed uh, that Mercedes built. We found them here in the U.S. in the C-Class vehicles as early as um, 2005 or the latter part of 2004. Again, it was the first 7-speed that Mercedes built, and a lot of guys were wondering why did the designation go from 7226 right to 722.9 instead of having a 7 or an 8. Well, there is a 722.7 and also a 722.8. Both of these units were not in vehicles that came into the U.S. market. The 7227 is actually a 5-speed front-wheel drive, it's very similar to the Honda platform. Uh, most common problems on those with the forward drum cracked and they would delay or lose forward. The 722.8 is a CVT transmission for Mercedes. Again, those were found in the um, A and B class, which we didn't see here in the States. Now the TCM or the mechatronics is mounted onto the valve body. So the conductor plate or contact plate, as well as the, uh, the uh, speed sensors, and temp sensor that's all one uh, piece of plastic. There's been problems in the aftermarket with purchasing or reprogramming the mechatronics 
due to uh, anti-theft issues worldwide. There is licensing that be uh, you can apply for. It's like three hundred and seventy-five bucks. Uh, you get a one hundred thousand dollar bond to cover any liabilities. And all this has been covered in other ATRA seminars, webinars, and articles. This presentation, I want to try to keep it to the internal components. We will cover some of the disassembly and reassembly procedures, as well as some of the important points to be aware of. I want to make a point here that the 7229 is very easy transmission to rebuild, and you'll see that throughout the uh, webinar. We started out by removing the bell housing and pump bolts from the front side only, inside the bell housing. The extension housing bolt, output shaft flange nut, we needed a deep socket, and we removed that and the flange using this 4x4 as an example. Two-wheel drive only requires moving the retainer and the flange nut or yoke. Uh, I apologize if you see anything uh, on your handout that refers to the extension housing. The extension housing does not come off this case. It's all one case. Now we can go ahead and remove the pan and the filter. There are six uh, Torx bolts for the pan with retainers. The filter just lifts right off the pump. You'll find that uh, Mercedes will tell you to replace the bell housing bolts, uh, the retainer bolts for the pan, valve body bolts. Uh, according to the manufacturer, these bolts should be changed. Some aftermarket kits will have some of the bolts in the kit that are, are vital to be changed, like especially valve body bolts. You may find those in the kit. I know a lot of techs out there are rebuilding these and are reusing the bolts. Now we want to remove the valve body from the main case. You'll find 10 uh, Torx bolts that hold the valve body to the case. Once this is done, we can now stand the bell housing onto two blocks or two 4x4 four four blocks of wood. This helps prevent the input shaft from hitting the bench and the unit rocking around a little bit. Now with the valve body off, we can remove this filter screen that we see here on the left. And when it goes back in, it goes screen first. Then we have the B3 brake clutch feed pipe, which is plastic. has a little rubber skirt on it. It has to face down the way you see here in the photo. And that goes right down there in the, in the middle of the case there and up towards the front. Then we have the two bolts at the bottom of the case. And that's going to retain the B2 brake clutch housing. Now the last two remaining bell housing bolts that we have to remove are the two that you see on this side of the bell housing going through the main case. Once we remove these two bolts, we can simply lift the case up off of the drivetrain. Now some techs are just uh, doing the same procedure but not using the wooden blocks. Uh, what they're doing is they, they just let the uh, input shaft touch the bench, and then when we remove these last two bolts, sometimes the weight of the uh, drive chain will actually uh, push the case off. Whichever process works for you, you can just continue using what you're more comfortable with. Now the B2 clutch housing will stay inside the case because the reverse brake clutch assembly is still in the case. We removed the two bolts, and so now we just have to remove the reverse brake clutches, and then we can just lift the B2 brake clutch housing right out of the back of the case. There's a couple more items in there we'll, we'll deal with in a few moments. But let's look at the different clutch assemblies. <clears throat> now, before we separate the B2 brake clutch assembly, uh, put two alignment marks on it that we're showing you here on the left. This way here, when we reassemble it, it'll be done correctly and we won't have any issues. On the right, you see we have an exploded view of the drum assembly itself. Now, the B2 brake clutch assembly end plane will vary according to clutch capacity. And you can see in the bottom left, we have a chart showing you uh, what the clutch clearance will be for each different clutch capacity. There'll be a dish plate. You'll find these on most of the clutch packs, and it'll have a dish plate 
the dish faces up as we're showing you here in the center uh, throughout the transmission. Now the snap ring is selective, so we give you all the OE part numbers as well as the thickness of the snap ring so you can get your end plate where you need it to be. Now going back together, we got the B2 breakdown inside, we're done with it. Uh, then we can go ahead and install the reverse brake clutch. Same thing with that, we take a feel gauge, we check the clearance, and you'll see that we have five clutches of steel and then that one cushion plate. Again, the dish face is up. Again, we have selective uh, snap rings. You have all the OE part numbers as well as the thickness for each snap ring for that number. We try to get our total end plate here to about 39 to 55 thousandths or 1 to 1.4 millimeters. Like I mentioned before, when we pulled the B2 brake assembly out, there's a couple more components laying in there, and that's the part gear and some of these end plate shims. There may be two or more. Uh, there may only be one, but we have to remember that they're there. We don't want to uh, mislocate them. Sometimes it's a good idea to take a nylon wrap and just uh, strap it right there onto the part gear so that we don't lose it when we go back together with it. And here on the left, I'm showing you basically uh, talk about the end plate shims. We don't want to lose them. As you can see, the whole drivetrain is now sitting on the bell housing from the output shaft all the way to the input shaft. So the next step would just be to lift the K3 drum and the rear simple planet off the assembly. What you're going to see next is there will be a thrust bearing, and it has a little lip on the inside edge and make sure that that goes down onto that section the way you see it here. Now under that ring gear we have a Revano planet and then we'll have the uh, K2 drum assembly. So while we have the output shaft and, and the drum out, uh, let's take a look at the output shaft. Sometimes there's some confusion on the assembly of how these races and bearings go back onto the output shaft. What we're showing you here is the inner step race goes on first, the bearing, then the flat outer race, and then the snap ring. On the right, we're also showing you that there is two ceiling rings that go into those grooves that you see right there. So that's the order of the assembly, how it goes on. Now with those components removed from the output shaft, we can simply take the center planet which is also a simple planet, just slide it right out of the rear planet and the K3 drum. Now there's a couple more things that we have on this part of the output shaft that we couldn't see before. There's two more ceiling rings, and then we also have a sleeved bearing. Now we can go ahead and remove the K3 drum and thrust bearing from the rear planet gear set. That'll all just slide right out. Now, in between there, you're going to have this thrust bearing with two tabs on it, and those tabs will align with the notches that you see here. Now we can go ahead and start disassembling the K3 clutch drum. What we're going to do first is remove the center and rear sun gear assembly which is also the K3 hub, we're going to slide that right out of the drum. On the right, I'm just showing you uh, with it flipped over. Because remember, this transmission has no sprags. It's a synchronous shift clutch-on-clutch -clutch application. So there's two O-rings on this section of the shaft, of the sun gear shaft, that have to come off. Also, the snap ring, the race, and the thrust bearing will have to come off in order to slide the shaft out through the rear sun gear and the K3 clutch hub. There's also a sleeve bearing. Once we have the shaft out, we need to inspect that, make sure there's no problems with the bearing rides on the shaft also. Now, when it came time to take the return spring out, we made our own homemade tool. We just basically took a 427E low sprag race. Uh, it worked fine for us. We could compress the spring 
and then we could go ahead and remove the L-shaped retainer snap ring that hold the uh, return spring in the drum. You're going to see this type of a snap ring throughout the webinar and in a few moments I'll show you some tricks to make it easier to remove. Here's an exploded view of the K3 clutch assembly. And you can see we have the L-shaped snap ring, return spring, the piston, pretty simple setup. Now the K3 clutch may have either single or double-sided frictions. Uh, most of the clutch assemblies that I mentioned before will have the dish plate, and that's how it faces up on all of them. To check the end plate on this drum, we, all we have to do is use some feeler gauges. Now, depending on the type of clutch and how many that are in there, our end plate is going to change. So you could have double-sided friction. You could have three, four, or five clutches in there. You could have single-sided. could be six, eight, or ten. So the end plate will be different. Also, you have the part number and the selective snap ring uh, shown to you right there on the chart on the right. Um, now we can go ahead and just lift the K2 drum and the Ravenel gear set, uh, which is the front planet, along with the thrust burning and raise off of the K1 and B3 clutch hub. And you can see the K1 and B3 clutch hub on the right. Now we can remove the uh, rear planet ring gear. You can see the snap ring, take the ring gear out. Now we can slide the K2 drum out of that section. And then it's your uh, front planet, which is a Ravenel planet set. Now on the K2 clutch assembly, we have uh, three sealing rings on the input shaft. We have another sleeve bearing down at the bottom of the shaft. And then we have the, a round retainer ring holding the retainer down over the uh, return spring. Then we have an O-ring on the piston as well as another O-ring down inside the K2 drum. Again, this drum like the others, the end play is going to vary according to the clutch capacity. We have another dish plate. You have all the end play specifications there on the left chart, as well as the OE part numbers and thicknesses of the selective snap ring on the right. Now we can remove the K1 B3 clutch hub. We're going to take that, just lift that right out of the B3 brake clutch assembly. Another thrust bearing. Bearing faces up the way you see it here. Now the first section to come off next will be the B3 brake brake clutch hub and the K1 clutch drum assembly. And then there's another thrust bearing. As you can see the bearings on the top and it has a skirt on the bottom and it goes back the way you see it here. <clears throat> and we have another L-shaped snap ring that holds the return spring in place. We have a molded piston on this drum and that's the brake B3 brake drum. Now as I mentioned before getting these L-shaped snap rings out that hold the return springs in place and you're going to find them throughout the transmission these can be a little tricky. Now the way we did it is we used a screwdriver and a pick with a 90 degree tip on it. We pried on the snap ring to bring it out of the groove a little, then we used the pick to work under the snap ring and to pry it up and away from the return spring. Uh, once the tip of the snap ring is exposed, take a couple of screwdrivers and with a little twisting motion and prying, we can actually go right along the snap ring and remove it. The end play on this uh, B3 brake, brake clutch assembly also varies according to clutch capacity also has a uh, dish plate. You have all the clearances as well as the part numbers for the different selective snap rings. And again, all these clutch packs real easy to check just using feeler gauges. Now for the K1 clutch assembly. It's another round 
uh, retainer ring. So this is a little bit easier. And we have an O-ring that's on that retainer. And you have the return spring, another molded piston. There's the thrust bearing we mentioned earlier. Of course, the K1 drum has the front sun gear on it. And then if you flip the drum over and take a look, you'll find that there's another sleeve bearing down inside the drum. This is something else that needs to be inspected for any damage or wear. Now, the K1 clutch assembly also has a single-sided friction. And again, depending on how many frictions, there's going to be a change in the actual end play. As a dish plate also, and all your OE power numbers and thicknesses for the selective snap ring retainer. Now, after we remove the B1 clutches from the housing that you see here on the right, do we have to remove the L-shaped snap ring, the return spring, which is beveled, and then there's a molded piston, and uh, two more sealing rings in here. <coughs> Along with that, we're going to take out the seven Torx bolts that hold the status support in the B2 brake clutch drum, the actual bell housing, and pump. We have enough, another thrust bearing with two tabs on it. They align with the notches you see here. Then, of course, we're going to have those seven uh, Torx bolts holding on to the pump. The easiest way they found to do this was to take the handle of a uh, plastic camera and just lightly tap on the stator shaft, and then the drum would just come right out of the back of the bell housing. Once we have the drum off the bell housing, you can see we have a pump plate here. This, this pump plate should be changed uh, during every overhaul. Once the uh, plate's out of the way, we take a couple of the pump bolts that we took out, uh, thread them back in, a few threads on each one, right across from each other. And then we can take our hammer and lightly tap on those, and then we can gently push the pump out through the front of the bell housing. Now the B1 clutch assembly is the exploded view of it. See we have a molded piston here, another one of those L-shaped uh, snap rings. Clutch end play on the B1 clutch is very simple. These use a double-sided friction. It also has a dish plate in it. Same thing as before, we just use a feeler gauge. And we want to get our clearance down to uh, 2 to 2.4 millimeters on a three clutch count. On the four, you'll notice that there's, it's 2.2 or 2.6, but there's also a, um, another model called the 722.93. So you could find a four clutch pack in either one of these units. But only the five clutch pack will be found behind the inside the uh, 722.93. Let's talk about the pumps for a moment. Now this pump assembly is almost the same as you would find on a 7226, whether it has the bushing or the bearing. The only difference you're going to find on the 7229 is in the suction side area of the pump, there's a little recessed area. Now, that was actually designed to prevent any intake noise. Um, I don't know of any issues with uh, noises on these pumps. I do know that they do have other issues. But you could actually swap these pumps back and forth. They will work either way. I prefer to update the pump to the bearing type. Um, uh, this prevents most of the common bushing failures that we see, although I've seen these bearing types fail also. If you do decide to update to the bearing type, you have to let your converter supplier know that you're going to use a bearing type uh, pump because the hub on the converter has to be hardened for that. Now, when Mercedes first started using these bearings, we researched it and found that several of them at the manufacturer's level uh, left with soft hubs on them using the bearing type. And that was on the very early models. I'm sure most of them have gone through the system already. But if you do change to the updated bearing type, you should let your converter supplier know that the hub on the converter has to be hardened for it. 
Like we said before, it's not uncommon to see pump failure on these, whether it's the bearing or the bushing. Usually it comes in looking like the one you saw on the left. And that's uh, the gears are all busted up. And if you look down inside the bell housing with the uh, pump gears right against the face of the bell housing, you can see it'll get all scored up and all this has to be changed. Not only do we see this before, but do we see it sometimes right after overhaul. I've seen these fail during a road test or come back two or three days later and you have the same uh, damage that it came in with. So we wanted to talk about that because we get a lot of calls on the 5R110Ws, uh, A's and Seikis, those type of vehicles doing the same thing. So here's some tips that will help prevent some of these issues on just about any pump that you have a problem with. The first and most important thing is the converter pilot is a tight fit to the crankshaft. So make sure if your, paint, if your converter supplier paints the converter, just sand the paint off the pilot. Make sure that the journal where the pilot rides in the crankshaft is free of any burrs or nicks. Don't forget, when the flywheel flexes, this pilot has to move in and out of that, uh, that bore, that journal. Clean any corrosion or debris you might find inside the journal. Take a little extra time. Take the, flywheel up, uh, the converter up to the flywheel. Make sure the pilot will move in and out of the crank nice and smooth. When you bolt up the converter to the flex plate, make sure to pull the converter all the way towards the crankshaft before you tighten down the bolts. You may have to go around and tighten each bolt gradually to get the converter to go all the way against the, the uh, crankshaft. Uh, make sure that the converter doesn't get bound up in the pilot. I've seen installers take the first bolt, nail it with a half-inch impact. Now the converter is cocked as they're going around uh, tightening up the other bolts or putting the other bolts in. Sometimes it still distorts the flywheel and the converter is still not sitting straight. Clean the engine block and the bell housing of any paint, debris, or corrosion because we want a good mating surface there. We don't want to have any ground issues. We want to be able to have a ground, having no problem to go from the block to the case. Check the dowel pins. Make sure they're sticking out far enough from the engine. Check the dowel pin holes in the bell housing. Make sure they're not worn out. Add a ground strap from the bell housing to the frame. This will help prevent any electrolysis. When you put the pump together, squirt some oil in it or coat the gears with some trans gel. Now here's some tips we're going to talk about on filling the transmission. This is especially on transmissions that are slow to fill. A's and Seikis were known for this. The old JR403s were like this. With the engine off, you usually add four quarts. On some of these vehicles, you put four quarts in it, you start it up. By the time you've walked out to start putting more fluid in it, that sump is already dry. So if it's a slow fill, you're not getting oil in it fast enough to keep the pump lubricated, and you're already going to start causing some damage to it. So what we'd suggest is put four quarts or even more. You can put six in there or seven. Start it up. Wait about 10 seconds. Turn the engine off. Add more fluid. Restart the engine again for 10 seconds. You can continue with that procedure until you've got to the fill capacity that's designed for this transmission. Now when it comes time to put the pump back in, we take a couple of bolts with the heads ground off and use those for guide pins. Put that in through the front of the bell housing. We take our new pump plate, set it down over our guide pins. And then we can go ahead and put our B1 clutch drum down. You can also see that there's an alignment down on that drum too. Okay, let's talk about the overall unit end play. As you can see, the unit is completely assembled. We have it facing downward. We take a caliper tool and a good flat piece of metal. We're going to actually measure the bore, uh, the depth of the bore, for it goes to the bearing pocket. This is where the bearing would actually sit right here. And we're going to measure from there to the top of our metal bar. We're going to take another measurement from that bar, but except this time we're going to go right down to where the shims would go on the back of the park here. So we don't have our shims in here yet. So with the seal and the bearing removed, we can do this. Take the two measurements, subtract them from each other. In this particular case, we've got about 42 thousandths of clearance. We would like to have about 12 to 21. 
So if we took a combination of shims, as you can see, we have the part numbers and the thickness of the shims, how many, uh, whatever amount it takes, two or three. Uh, we came up with a combination of 28,000, which gives us a clearance of about 14,000. Simply place the shims right there on the back of the part gear, and then we can go ahead and install the uh, rear bearing. Once the uh, clearance is achieved, we can install the bearing, the snap ring, then we can put the rear seal in, and then last but not least, we can go ahead and put in the flange and the retainer nut. Now we're at the valve body. Uh, we're going to remove the four torx, torx bolts and retaining brackets for the solenoids. So each bracket holds two solenoids in place. We have some blue tip and black tip solenoids. They work ex opposite of each other. You cannot swap those locations. You want to keep everything back, uh, put back to where it came from. The two orange O-rings on the uh, case connector, uh, those have been updated by some of the aftermarket if they have uh, leak issues. To make sure we change those. I identified all the solenoids for you here, uh, but one of the things I wanted to point out is this spacer ring that's at the base of the solenoid. There's sometimes when you take these solenoids out or you're washing up the unit, you may not see that uh, spacer ring fall off. If it doesn't get put back to where it was, when we put these solenoids back down onto the valve body, they're not going to sit correctly. So remember, your conductor plate on this transmission is not like a 7226. You're looking right here at the mechatronics or the TCM, whichever you want to call it. So there's the mechatronics. There's our speed sensors. This also is a float. It helps prevent oil from getting up into the gear train and getting aerated. You have another speed sensor here our rain sensor and that temp sensor all, all incorporated into that one piece of plastic. So now we can remove the seven bolts that hold the uh, contact plate and the mechatronics from the valve body. And then it only leaves us four more bolts uh, on the con uh, to, uh, from the connector plate side uh, to, to split the valve body apart. One thing I want to point out is there's an alignment pin. It's a free-floating pin. It's actually captured between the detent spring on one side. You can see there's a pocket here for it. It sits right in this hole. Once this is down, we'll hold it in on this side. But the actual contact plate on the other side would prevent it from coming out of this hole. So be careful not to lose that pin during teardown. Check ball information. Each of the steel check balls are actually sealing off uh, what's actually a test port circuit that's used by the factory. For te or they have a factory tool that will go in and unseat the check ball so they can check the uh, different circuits for any leaks. Make sure that each one of these are seated. You may want to lightly tap on it. Make sure it's got a good seat. Uh, you don't want these to leak out to exhaust because they'll go right into the pan. Uh, you can pour some oil or solvent on them to make sure they're not leaking through the other side. Then you only have actually two rubber check balls. Make sure we check those for damage. They're not coming apart. They're not splitting or they're chewed up. And then on this side, we identify what each check ball uh, function is. As you can see, all the steel balls, each clutch that it's uh, sealing off the exhaust. The other one I'd like to mention is the rubber check ball you see down at the bottom on the right. That's the B2BR check ball. If that's missing, you'll get no movement. Now here's just what usually happens. You install the unit, it was moving when it came in, you have absolutely no movement. You look on scan data and everything looks fine. And the part that puzzles you is if this thing doesn't move and I move the shifter and it can see the engine revving, it sees the throttle opening, why doesn't it set a code? I can't answer that. All I can tell you is we get this call so often it's, it's not even funny. That check ball missing, no movement, no codes. Meanwhile, everything will look normal on the data stream. 
Then we have seven small check valves and one large one. I've also identified each clutch circuit or uh, a hydraulic circuit that's involved with each one of those. Now they go down inside the valve body the way you see them, the larger or the black side down first. Here's an exploded view of the valve body. I would take a close look at these. Anything that has to do with solenoid regulating, you may find these boards worn out. Vacuum testing would be the best way to go. Or if you had a little clear test plate with the hole drilled in it, you can squirt oil into one circuit uh, and block it off and then see if uh, air, air and oil actually goes through to the next side. If it does, obviously we need to either repair this, uh, looking for some any aftermarket repairs, or you'd have to replace the valve body. There's another converter regulating valve I would take a close look at. We see this valve wears out quite often, probably the most uh, popular valve to wear out in the valve body. But these really need to be checked thoroughly. When we put the valve body back down onto the case, uh, we want to make sure that we index the manual valve correctly. A little cutout for it, and that fits right over the pin on the rooster cone. Now that often gets missed when uh, it's reinstalled. Now for the pan, uh, the, the sump has a stand-up pipe. There's no filler tube on this unit, so everything has to be drained and filled and topped off through the uh, that opening in the pan. Now there's been some updates, not only to the pan, but to the overfill tube. The first update that we saw on the early ones uh, they increased the pan depth by about three millimeters and they changed the overflow tube or the standpipe from a short metal black one to a 13.5 millimeter longer plastic tube. Uh, it's a natural or a white color. And then they made another change. This one came out about June of 2010. They actually went to a slightly shorter green plastic tube, but when they went to that tube, they increased the pan depth by another five millimeters, which is about two more millimeters than the first update. Most of the ones that you run into uh, will be the ones that you see here with the uh, white plastic uh, uh, stand-up pipe. On the latest update, when they changed the pan and made it five millimeters deeper, uh, which you have the part number here for this one, the easiest way to tell between the two is these large oval dimples that are actually in the pan. They're much larger than the earlier one. Now, when they went to this later pan, shorter stove pipe, changed the color of that little uh, pipe, they also changed the fluid. And the fluid got updated, and the part numbers here in the, in the handout material for the fluid, and even the color of the fluid changed. It changed to a blue color. Uh, some of the earlier fluid was more like a a yellowish green tint to it. When it comes time to fill up the transmission, again, there's no filler tube. Uh, I wanted to make this easy, so I just went on uh, Google, and I Googled NAG2 fill tools and adapters, and I came up with tons of them on there. So there's many different ways you can do this. And we have the case here checks in your handout. I like to regulate my shop, uh, the, my blowgun has a regulator on it. I like to dial it down to about 30 PSI. Uh, to me, that's a better way to check the clutch. If I'm running full shop here, I may miss something and may actually pop the clutch on and I, I won't catch the leak. And then we have the torque specs for you. And these are all the torque specs that I put together from uh, OE. Also would like to mention that this basically highlights uh, the 7229 rebuild book that we sell at ATRA. Uh, you can go to our website and purchase it. It's about 50 bucks. And that's about it for today's presentation. Again, thanks to uh, Seal Out the Market Product for sponsoring it, making it free to everyone. I want to thank you all for attending. Appreciate it. Appreciate your time. If you have any questions, 
uh, please go ahead and click on the little icon next to your name, the hand or the question mark, so I know that you are texting something in and that I won't end too soon.